simple. You just configure all the account settings that only administrators can create accounts, and you basically lock out the mechanism for creating accounts on the site. So that's not new. Um, another thing is that when, I, when users sign in, users are using their Facebook or Google, I wanted to bring in some profile information. In this case, a first name and last name. So I created those profile fields within Google to contain that information. And here's where it gets a bit interesting. When I was thinking about an example uh, of how to apply concepts into Drupal, uh, the modules run really hard ready. It's been like, evolving really quickly. So all of this session was going to be like hands-on coding. And then uh, I found out that the open ID connect module is actually working and it's working very well. So I decided to use that as a base. And we're going to extend that module to the custom plugin because the open ID module just works for Google. So, Number one, what, what is OpenID? Uh, is anyone familiar with OpenID and a lot? Is about half of the room? Uh, OpenID Connect is a protocol that's based on top of OAuth 2. And what that means is that OAuth is a protocol for authentication, and OpenID Connect uh, provides us a layer of identification on top of that. So what usually what happens, um, this is a very broad review, it's not very exact, but it gives us an idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, we have a user, and the user requests uh, your browser, your website. So Chrome requests, or makes a request to your server, right? It goes to your website. And your website, um, it will try to log in the user, but it's, it's going to redirect, issue a redirect to the browser, and the browser will redirect to Google, so the user can provide their credentials in there and do the login through Google. And if that goes on correctly, that, uh, that's that what we describe as a the hourly A, the authorization request. Uh, then the, the user provides his credentials to Google, he signs in with Google. And then Google will issue, if everything goes okay, Google will issue a redirect with uh, an authorization code to the browser. <coughs> the browser will then issue a redirect on the C uh, arrow to your website. So the redirect contains the authorization code that got returned from Google. And with that authorization code, your website is going to request a token to Google. So what it's trying to do is exchange authorization code for a token in Google. And it, it, that way it, it's, it's making sure that the authorization code actually came from Google and Google will, re will return a token response. And that way with that token your website can do an authenticated um, request to Google to fetch more information if needed. So that is just a last two. Um, and as you can see, it will just, like, it's a way to communicate, authenticate, I mean, authorize uh, your browser to do a request on behalf of the user from your web from your server to Google. Uh, but it, it has no identification, so it has no idea to know what the, who the user is or what his profile information is or anything else. So what OpenID Connect asks is that when the server returns the, on the arrow key from Google to the browser with an authorization code, it will also add another token called the client ID. And the client ID is a JSON encoded, uh, a JSON web token, it's called. So that token actually contains the user information, some basic profile. So it could be like the Google user ID. And um, when, the, when your browser decodes that token, it will use the token also to turn on step E. And it can fetch more information from Google. But now it can identify who the user is as well. So this sounds a bit complicated, and um, unfortunately, the OpenID Connect module takes care of all this back and forth for us. Uh, so what we're going to do is see this simple example right now with Google, how that works out. Basically, the, the OpenID Connect model has that already in itself. It enables endpoints to do that. So um, what I'm doing is just downloading the model. In my case, I was using a composer based Google, so this is composer required. You can download the module for Rush or whatever. Uh, and then you install the module, and that's the config screen of the module. So here's an interesting thing the user claims mapping. The claims are just like profile information, it's just a different terminology for the same thing. So uh, the claims are already uh, a standard defined by the OpenID protocol. So I'm just mapping the claims of line as OpenID into user profile fields. The given name from OpenID, I'm going to map it to the 
first name to Drupal, the last name to the family name to the last name. So to actually configure it to work with Google, uh, it will request the client ID and a client secret. So you need to create an application on Google uh, through their developer, developer's console. Uh, you need to add the Google allows to client ID, it will give you the client ID secret. And Google wants to make sure that all these services, you know, it wants to know that where it can redirect, what are the authorized redirect URLs, so it can make sure that Whatever token is sending is just to your website and not any client that requests it. So you need to let Google know what your redirect URL is. And for the open ID model, we're using this model is uh, HTTP, your website, and then open ID slash connect slash Google. Uh, and another thing I found out was that um, by having the client ID a secret, it allows you to make requests to Google, but it will not give you the profile information. To actually fetch the profile information, you need to enable uh, the Google Plus API for your application. So that's just something that I'm going to have to figure this. Other than that, I just added the open ID when I log in to Google. And we have a inside with Google. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a block up there. We have a button logging with Google, and if you click it, obviously you're not signed. It will redirect to Google and it will ask if you authorize your application to your email and basic profile information. If you click allow, it will redirect back to your site and you can see it fetched in this your information. So up to here, it's been really simple. Everything works out. It's site building and it's really, really nice. So I wanted to see how that worked out for Facebook. And it turns out. No. So all of these users that I'm creating, they, did, they, were, they didn't have a user Google. The only user account in Google was a user one account. So what the information you store is in uh, a some some contacts in the company, not the user. Oh, the, the users are going to be created, but only when they log in through Google or oh. Facebook. Oh, okay. So okay. only then when they authorize them, then the account gets okay. created. Okay. Then Google. <coughs> And it's associated with that social running account. So that's the one way we'll be able to log in. So when I try to do this for Facebook, it turns out Facebook does not use open ID protocol. Why? I guess it's because they have a lot of money and they can like they have a big enough market share to implement their own protocol. So <laughs> it's just uh, they've got their own protocol base also on OA too. So it actually turns out it's pretty similar. And instead of writing code from scratch, I decided to extend the open ID module with a custom Facebook client and write a little bit of blue code for that to work out. So this is where we get my hands dirty. So we generate a basic module. Um, and the most basic structure of your module is just a YAML file, info YAML file. And all that it declares is that uh, uh, we have a module making an example, and we have to have a dependency of the open ID connect module. Uh, how many of you here have created modules for AAA? Okay. So the directory structure of where you're supposed to put your classes, that's most of them. So to know what code I actually needed to extend, I went to, to see the Open ID Connect module. And I saw some interesting stuff around there. So the first thing is when we look at the module, they have a uh, look at the source files, they have an annotation. The Open ID Connect time. Is there a point on this? Yes. So we have an annotation in there, an annotation class. And then we have another thing called the Open ID Connect Client Manager. And that is within the plugin Open ID Connect. Um, we have a plugin system. So what this tells us is that they're using plugins to extend their own modules. So that's really interesting. And when the module implements a plugin, it needs to find a new, a new annotation. So that's the way you're always going to find out that the, the, uh, there's plugins implementing that new kind of annotation. 
and it does that through the client manager. So the client manager is the class that's going to look for all the plugins of a certain type. And looking at the client manager class over here, uh, we can see that it extends the whole plugin manager that just also is the plugin manager. Uh, and the interesting thing is here, the constructor, you can tell, you can see where it's going to look within a module to see plugins of that particular time. So it's going to look at the plugin open ID connect client folder and then namespace as well, obviously. Um, and then each plugin that implements this, uh, this type of plugin uh, should implement this interface. The Drupal Open ID Connect plugin will be the client interface. And the name of the annotation is this one. So, so, so this module can actually find the plugin that we can create with Facebook. It needs to have those two things. It needs to be placed in that um, directory structure within our module. It should expand this class. And I mean, it should implement this interface. And it should contain that annotation that is described in here. And also another thing, you can see that it's using the same thing to discover its own plugin in here. So it's very clearly in the same directory structure, plugin, open ID, connect client, and within the namespace. <coughs> so if anyone is wondering what is actually a plugin, uh, there's no pieces of functionality that it can be inter interchangeable because they're defined by an interface. <coughs> So because you have an interface, an interface is not implemented is a contract of functionality. It just says that whenever you have a class implementing this interface, you can use it in the same way no matter which class it is because it's going to have the same methods within there. So even though they do things in a different way, they can't be used in the same way. Uh, so that's going to be clear once we do this example. So other types of plugins in Google are blocks, field types, CQF plugins, text filter, content type, often in our case. Uh, so that's the preferred way to extend Google in, in Google A to create plugins. When you need your module to be extendable, you should provide a plugin, uh, plugin manager. So to create our actual Facebook plugin, uh, we created a class, class Facebook. Uh, and it's going to extend the open ID to that client base. So it turns out most modules when they define uh, plugins. So besides defining the, the interface, they will usually provide a base class that you can extend. And that base class already implements the interface. So it's got like the base functionality there, and mostly you use it to fill in the lines. You can also find this for the for the block, uh, block base class, it's already implementing the block interface. Uh, and almost uh, most of the core uh, plugins as well. You can, there's already a class implementing the base functionality and you need to extend it. Uh, the other thing that you should know is that our class is using the annotation as defined by the plugin manager. So besides having our class, uh, we need to add this comment section that's actually an annotation that will get parsed with PHP and it will get discovered as an open ID connect client plugin. And the last thing is that you should place your class in the directory structure with the drive namespace to be discovered and downloaded as well. So uh, for the OpenID Connect client base, uh, the basic thing you need to tell it to be, so you can configure the Facebook, are the endpoints that it's going to use for each of those token requests. So for authorization, this uh, looks too good to find out, it's not very clear. Um, Facebook basically provides APIs for the web, and their APIs for the web are JavaScript. So uh, it's actually annoying, everybody looks up for the web, their documentation just likes JavaScript. So I found out those these three these three were the endpoints that were required for Facebook. <coughs> uh, and even though the, these are the authorization, the token, and the user info endpoints, they don't return the data exactly in the format that's required for the OpenID 
uh, protocol to work. So I did end up writing a bit of uh, overwriting some functions from the base class just to get around the format, you could say, of the, the, the input parts of their protocol. Uh, I can show that a little later on. But what I want to point out in here are the, the sign patterns that Drupal is using to extend other modules you can reuse on your own code. Uh, I also provided an empty configuration for my module. Uh, so if it's on the big install directory structure. And basically what this is saying is that when you enable my module, uh, the Facebook connect plugin should not be should be disabled by default. I don't want to enable it. Uh, because we don't have no client ID in CPU yet. That's going to be custom for each site that gets installed. I just provide the fault enable values. So just by having that class in there, we already have uh, it's already discoverable by Google to enable the system of the model, and we can configure it. So to, the configuration is very similar to the creating a client, uh, an application of Google. Uh, you create your app on Facebook. Uh, Facebook has a bunch of app categories, app for names, app for many other stuff. So in my case, it was an application for a page. Uh, and you can select which products you want to enable, which is like similar to Google that you know which APIs you want to use. So I wanted to enable the Facebook login for my application and just enable the client log login and web log login as uh, the way that the user could, could use the system. And the directory log was very similar to the one of Google, you just change Google to Facebook. That would give us a client ID secret. Figuring that we now have an extra login called login to Facebook and Click it, uh, it will send you to Facebook to try to authenticate and authorize. Uh, if you continue, then you get to create your account and it will flash the user information. So that was pretty neat. However, since in our sample site, uh, we don't want users, the users are not going to have a user and password on our side. We want them to send it, we want to send it to either Google or Facebook to log in. It doesn't really make much sense uh, to have the user slash login page because that will come the user for their website, for their login. So what I did was I wanted to create a landing page so users could log in through that landing page. So how do you actually create a landing page in Google? Like add another route. We used to do that through a quick menu, uh, but we don't have it anymore. So uh, we need to generate a controller. Controllers are the main way to provide paths um, for the routing system. So I'm, I'm using console in here. Uh, we just tell it what module that our controller is going to be for, like a sample module. We give it a class name, the class name we're in there. Uh, and we need to tell uh, which action that page is going to call. So what method is going to be called within the class, basically. And we provide a path. And here we have another design pattern from Google. We can load services from the container. The whole dependency injection thing just has a lot of hype around it, but it's, it's really not so complicated. Uh, it's just basically delegating the creation of other classes to another, uh, to the container, which is a Google object in itself. So that way our code does not need to bother of knowing like, which class to create and when to create it. You can just provide that Drupal is going to pass whatever object you need already instantiated so your code can use it whenever you want to. And you delegate that to the container. You need to bother about knowing the, name, the namespace of the classes or any anything else. So in this case, I'm um, loading from the container. I will be using the plug builder because I'm going to create a form. And it creates two files here, the controller class and a routing demo. So if you look at the routing demo, uh, a couple of things also come up. Number one is that all of our routing people now have a machine to use, which goes in there as well. The code menu you can the, the key was actually like the path to your custom directory to your URL. Uh, in Drupal we actually have a machine name which is much more consistent. And we have a path, so we actually find a path for 
You must tune in for the user login page as the user got one. Okay. So in the case of the, my page that I created, the small sign-on page, The machine name was example dot SSO login controller login page. Are those so routes discoverable somehow without having to go back and read the code in the user login, the existing user login? Or? Yeah, if you like you can go to the module and see the definition of the routing file, the routing YAML oh. file. Uh, but then again, because they can be altered for other modules, uh, like if it's easier if you use like a debugger. There's a console control, or there's a console command for it too. Oh, to the the Yeah. yeah. Uh, router colon debug. Okay. So I guess it will end up, 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 it will yeah, yeah, because yeah. uh, it's just asking the uh, the uh, appropriate service, and the alter are operating on the same service. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So it'll give you a list, and then you can actually type uh, router colon debug space machine name, mm -hmm. and give details on it, like where it came from. Yeah. Okay. So 
There is also a great blog post from Lulabot, which you can take a look. It explains, in three well explain how to, which, which events you can subscribe to, and, and how to, what's yeah, it? I guess like, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought immediately that kernel exception would be uh, what you'd be waiting for. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, that, am I right in saying that that's pretty low level? Yeah. Yeah, and actually, if you go to the kernel, I don't remember the class name, that, that class will give you listing all the events you can and respond to, and it tells you when this event is happening, when is this trigger. Yeah. I don't remember the class name, we can just get it. Yeah, I, I'm going to go to my computer and go to the slides just so you can see the source code. And the, like, what I think I mentioned right now, there are like 40 events that are in Google, so mm -hmm. it doesn't take too much just to read through them and see what they're doing. Actually, it's easier to run research uh, events than research talks. Yeah, actually, it's much more fun because yeah. you can actually put like a breakpoint in your code and react to events, and mm -hmm. just like you react to exceptions, they're kind of on the same way. So uh, another thing that I just wanted to point out, talking about the sign patterns, is that we're following it's, it's almost like the same structure. So that's a design pattern we can work. Like we have a path services, and those will actually allow us to get into the execution. We will get all the certain files of execution. So just to get this in code, uh, this is our class, and it's implementing the event subscriber interface. And what the event subscriber interface is expecting is a static method called get subscribe events. So what it's doing is, it's basically returning an array of the events that this class is handling. So it's saying that when there's a kernel event of the type exception, it's going to call the, the callback will be on kernel exception in this class, which is this function right here. And um, here's where you can put your letter and see what all the kernel exceptions could be as well. <laughs> um, that works. And I'm listening to see if the exception that gets thrown is an instance of the core of the exceptions because there, there could be possibly like page not found or a bunch of other exceptions that this class could react to. So I'm looking for an access and I gauge to the exception. Um, and what I'm doing is if the user is not logged in, then I will redirect them to the single sign on login page using the machine name of the route. So it will get the URL to that round, and this uh, you can set a response for that event, and you just set the response to be a new redirect response. And that will, you know, once we this get executed, it will return a response that was issued with redirect for the kind of gene. So now if you go to the slash admin, uh, and you're not logged in, it will redirect to the single sign-on page. And if you don't have the destination parameter here, once you log in, you will return to the page you want to be. What would happen in the event that you were logged in, but you did, still didn't have permission to go to the admin page? Mm -hmm. You could bounce back to that page? In that case, because my code is only doing the redirect and the user is not logged in, uh, my code would do nothing, and the exception would proceed, and it will show you that mm -hmm. system that page. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Uh, so, um, what claims do you use to assign roles to, to the create single sign-on users? So right now I'm not mapping any roles, it's just authenticated role. But you could pull information from the user profile and map it to roles as well. Yeah. And uh, another question. Uh -huh. what, uh, what unique ID do you use and where do you store it in, in Drupal? In Drupal 7 I think you use the outmap table. And so the open ID module will, will take, um, so actually that I actually touch upon that in here in the code. So this is the open ID module, the custom module. Look at the source, plugin, the Facebook class. So these are just methods that I'm overwriting. Uh, so there's a retrieve user information function. Uh, let's see where that is. So here it is. For the ID token, the other token that gets returned from the authorization endpoint, uh, because Facebook does not return it in the correct format, but that ID token contains should contain a parameter uh, called SUV. Uh, so what that contains is like the remote ID of the user. So this would be in the case of Facebook, like the Facebook user ID. In the case of Google, it would be the Google user ID. And the Open ID Connect module, uh, when it does the login, it will. It has its own off map from the you know whatever client you're using their uh, their unique ID into the Drupal user that's connected with that unique ID. Um, so the retreat tokens. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so you're using. The existing open ID class to store that information in Drupal for subsequent requests. Right? The information will get saved into the database, from, uh, but within the Open ID Connect module. So all I'm doing is uh, through the Facebook uh, plugin class, what I'm doing is just formatting the stuff in a way that the Open ID module can. Um, it's expecting it. Okay. I guess I'm curious. Like you have the. If you go to the login page, and, or if you go to an access to that page, you have to do that. So, but if you wanted to include something like a kill switch, mm -hmm. so that on an admin page you could turn the, that functionality off, how would you go about saving that? I mean, in D7 it was in a variable that you'd set in the variable table. And then do it. But how do you inject that kind of administrative? You know, I, maybe to the question. Like, what's the pattern that you would use to make your own admin form addition on that module that you could save just a checkbox? Yes, do an off. Uh, uh, so, uh, if you do wanted it. to alter the form, that's uh, like the config form. Yeah. Okay. So, you can also, um, I think it's part of the class, the space class, the plugin that you're implementing, uh, that you could add, add some stuff to the, to the basic form. Let me just see if that's correct. So there, part of the base class definition has a build configuration form. So that would be where you could add any other uh, configuration to your plugin. I, I guess, and that I see there's a, this configuration, right? So like that is the configuration of this. Um, yeah, it's a configuration of that particular plugin. And, and that context is you extend the existing configuration form and add your own field to it. And yes. You'll just be adding another element onto that configuration object. Onto that object. configuration object. And, but the OpenID module is the one that takes care of actually saving that object okay. into an That's entity in Drupal. So by just extending the plugin, you can alter the form and it will automatically get saved into the structures that the OpenID module provided. Okay. Okay. Um, more questions? Yes. How would you link the claims uh, configurable? Like, if you want to take like, like different kind of claims from different uh, identity IDs, for example, Google, Facebook, if you have different claims mm -hmm. and your different identity providers, how would you configure it and go for Well, the model already provides that configuration of mapping. 
So all you need to do know is like the open ID claim name and map it to whatever Drupal um, whatever Drupal profile fields, fields are needed. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you needed to do any further customization, like after the, the user gets created and like compare some claims into, I don't know, maybe custom roles that you're creating mm -hmm. or do some conditions, uh, the module does provide some, I think it's still doing a through hooks. So that's why I didn't want to yeah. show that code, because it's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the OpenID Connect module has, uh, I think it's a Connect account. No, there, there's a, uh, a hook around here. I think it's this one. When it logs in the user, login finalize. Uh, yeah, it invokes the user login thing. So that's what I mean, that we still have a bunch of hooks in Drupal and Eventually, those are going to be moved into events, but we're still not there. But if you're writing code, try not to create hooks, try to get events. Okay. Is there any documentation that basically says what, what are the equivalent DA that provokes D7? No, I don't think so. It would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think we're all like are, rediscovering ways, us. and the the thing that, that I, sorry, go ahead. Change records. Change records. Yeah. Change records. If you can type the correct change record, it will tell you like that. There's not like like when Google sent to Google seven and they lost this or this or this. Yeah. Okay. If you made that blog post, it would immediately go in my feed. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. Yeah. So this is the documentation page for all the core events that Drupal has. So it looks like like it's not so long. Yeah. So there's entity type events, config type events, migration events, and kernel events, basically. That's it. Routing events. So, um, but I think this is going to be incrementing, like with contrib module, because this is just core. Okay. Um, I think we're, we're done with the time, so any other questions we can move to that. Thanks.